Good evening. Welcome to this fine Tuesday afternoon. It has been a good day so far. Today is March the 31st of the year 2020. And I don't think when we were closing out 2019, we would have expected the year that we have had so far. Now, before we get into our conversation, I need to turn on the little things at the bottom of the screen that tell you how you can participate in our study here, or our conversation really is more like what it is, our conversation tonight. A couple of ways that you can join the conversation if you are watching us on our Facebook channel, then use the Facebook comments beneath the video that is playing. Sometimes people may drop a comment into um, <clears throat> the comment the comment area of the post that was shared. But if you click on the video and the video starts playing, then there'll be a comment area there. That's where you where you want to drop your comments. On YouTube, you use the comment the chat room chat area there in YouTube. If you would like to um, identify us through Twitter, send a comment that way. That is at John Duval. And so just kind of take note of that. You'll see that on the screen there as it goes beneath me. But you can also send us a text message. You can send that to 405-726-0874. To That's our phone number, 405-726-0874. And we'll also take phone calls there. If I know ahead of time that you're going to call me and you need to text that number to let me know that you'd like to talk on the air, um, then we'll bring you in. Otherwise, if you call and you can leave a comment, I'll just read that comment to everybody or play your comment over the air as well. Either way, we'd like to hear from you this evening as we join this conversation talking about things that are going on within our world today. Now, I want to give you a little update here on Oklahoma in regards to the number, oh, 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 First and foremost, I want to do something else before I do that real quick. So if you were able to watch ahead of time, you saw a slideshow of people who sent in selfies. Now, if you saw your selfie and you're like, Ack, I didn't want that picture to be shown, then take another one and you can email it to me. Send it to selfie, that's S-E-L-F-I-E -E, at johnduval.net. But what we've been doing, we've been putting some uh, information on social media, inviting participants to send in a selfie of themselves. And what we'll do is we'll put that into a, uh, a role that will play a pre-discussion, pre, pre if you would. And then that way people can kind of see that we are all in this, all in this together and the various types of people <laughs> who participate in this discussion. So if you'd like to do that, uh, you'll see it on these images there, selfie at johnduval.net. Uh, just send it to me there if you would. I'd be happy to bring it into the show. And again, seriously, if there is a picture of you on the pre-show and you'd rather not be there, please let me know ASAP and I'll pull it down. Now, I have all, now there are no names on those pictures, so you've probably already noticed that. But I've put together a post-show credit that will roll for about 40 seconds when we're done. And that's where I thank you by name for your selfie. So there's no actual connection with name and picture, if that matters. And sometimes it does, actually. All right, so let me go ahead and bring up real quick Oklahoma. And I think if Je when Jesse was here about a week ago, he was talking to us about the number of cases and so forth. Well, I was looking today at what our most recent Oklahoma number is. That's the United States. There we go. The most recent Oklahoma number as of earlier today was 565. Um, notice the increase. I don't know if you can make it out too well on your screen there, but somewhere around um, March 16th, we had around 10 roughly. And then by the time of March 19th, you'll notice there that it was all the way up to 44. And then March 24th, 81, and now it is shot up. Part of the reason is because now they have more testing kits, and so they're able to test more people. And they said the numbers would probably rise once they had those tests in. But I want to put that kind of in perspective, if you would, 
to the United States of America. There's total cases as of today, 163,539 with about 2,860 deaths. You wanna know how we rank as far as a, a nation of multicolors with the darkest here being the worst, that's 5,001 and high or higher, or this state right here, Wyoming, which is one to five, if I've got the right color match, that may be six to 50. But good old Oklahoma, well, we're in that 501 to 1,000. And the stats on this chart for Oklahoma is not, has not been updated, updated yet. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, someone says, why do you want to bring this all up? We hear it every day on the news. Well, I want to talk to you about a story. <clears throat> you probably were watching the news this morning, and there was a preacher. Now, listen, there, there have been a lot, of, a lot of individuals say, you know, the government cannot tell me to stop washing. I can't talk. The government cannot stop telling me, they cannot tell me to stop worshiping my God. And the government's not telling us that, but that's the way it's kind of taken. And so there was a preacher down in Florida. And I want to bring, I'm going to share his picture here because it's made public has been made public so many times. And um, he decided he was going to have services anyway, no matter what. Now, a lot of churches have continued to meet despite the various requests and orders. But this man did something different, and I won't take the time to read the whole article. And, and just for, for citation pur purposes, this is from the Tampa Bay Times. So if you want to look it up and read more into the article there about this individual, and his name is Rodney Howard Boone. See, the problem is he was at a mega church. There, there's your issue right there. Not really. I'm kidding about that. But here's, here's the point, though. Okay, so here's what he did. He planned this ahead of time. It was a bold action against what had been requested by the government. You go and read the article because I don't remember this being covered on the news story. The article says he bust people in, supposedly bust them in. It's kind of like some of these protest rallies where they bust people in. Well, he bust people in so that they could be there and support his services. All right, hang on just a second there. We've got a call coming in and I know who it is. So I'm going to go ahead and take this call right away. And this is Dale Decker who is calling us right now. Mr. Dell, how are you? I am fine, thank you. You were live and on the air, you might say. I just wanted to let you know that on March 10th, there was a denominational choir of 60 people that met. Uh, they practiced social distancing and also uh, cleansed their hands. All right, go ahead. I am fine, John. How are you? Thank you. You were live and on the You might need to mute your video, Dale. I just wanted to let you know that on March 10th, there was a denominational choir of 60 people that met. So they practiced social distancing. So what was the end of the story there when you talked about Well, I'm sorry I interrupted your story about the preacher because I did get that message as well. No, go ahead. You're good. You're good. On March 10th, there was a denominational choir of 60 members that met. They practiced social distancing of six feet apart and used hand sanitizer. Uh, but shortly after that, 45 of them came down with the uh, COVID-19 virus, of which, uh, if I remember right, four of them now have died. And so wow. this is just another example of what can happen even when we think uh, we're doing things right, uh, if you just have one person sneeze, uh, even within that six feet distance, yeah. uh, they can spread the virus to other people, and eventually everybody can get it. So I just thought you might like to add that to what you were saying about the preacher. Well, Dell, I appreciate that. And I'll tell you how that, that's actually a little more relevant than the preacher because that happened way back early on. Yeah, that was March 10th. Yeah. Um, and you, you honestly never know. When we go back that early, I remember, you know, we were talking about whether or not we should meet and we were 
try to think, should we try to enact some of the things separation? But there's no guarantee in this case proves it. So. Yeah, and you know, and we may think as young people that we're healthy, but we're already seeing there's already been one infant that has died from this virus. Uh, there's been several examples now of, of men, and it seems like men are dying more frequently than women for whatever reason, but even in the uh, ages of the 40s, uh, there have been uh, deaths. And these are people that were completely healthy. They had no heart disease, no diabetes, or anything like that. Maybe a little bit overweight, but you just never know how serious this virus is going to be uh, at any given time. That's true. That is true. And Dale, I appreciate you calling in and reminding us of that. That's very, very important. You bet. I appreciate it. We'll continue to watch. I appreciate it. Call again if you got some more thoughts now. All right. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's, well, there you have it. I mean, they practiced social distancing. They thought everything was going to be perfectly fine, and they were following, trying to apply the general rules. And even then, in that closed environment, it was not enough. And I appreciate Dell uh, calling in and reminding us of that. This uh, preacher we were talking about, clearly didn't learn from this lesson. And, and the article, and again, I'm quoting, or not quoting, I'm referencing, paraphrasing the, what some of the things the article said about him. The article pointed out that he's a conspiracist and apparently he has a podcast. So anyway, they, 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 you know, he was arrested. And the charges, if you haven't seen the story, this is very interesting. Let me see if I can locate that real quick here on the specific charges. Let's see. Here's a statement that, is, that was um, quoted. And let's see, bring this back over and there. So because of the reckless disregard of public safety and after repeated requests and warnings, um, the, the sheriff here, Chad Grosnis, uh, Cronister, sorry, says, I worked with our state attorney, Andrew Warren, to obtain a warrant for unlawful assembly and violation of public health emergency rules, both of which are second degree misdemeanors. misdemeanors. Now, so they arrested him, he bailed out, and he was doing a podcast or something this morning, and the news played an interesting clip. And what I found very interesting, and it could be their choice, maybe he said a lot more than this, and they just shared this one piece of, of information, but what he said was, he was not ashamed of being arrested for, you would think, for worshiping God. You would think for preaching the gospel of Christ. No, it was because of his First Amendment. He, he was proud to be arrested because of the First Amendment. He was holding to his freedom of speech. And so that tells me that maybe there are some questions about the motivations and so forth. And the spectacle that was made of all that. And they were, according to the article, they were warned by their attorney, by the um, city's attorneys days before it happened. And they even faced, they, they kind of rubbed the city's face in it by streaming it live on Facebook. So um, what will be interesting, and I don't know if they'll ever make the news, is if some of the members there contract the virus as a result of that assembly. So, yeah, definitely, definitely scary, scary stuff. And I point this out for the simple reason of trying to remind us to be careful. It's that simple. It's not going to go away. They just got to figure out how to deal with it. And so we, we're going to go on, we're going to live our lives. We'll live by these, these restraints and then life will continue on. So here in a few minutes, what we're going to consider is Psalms 59. I think Psalms 59 would be a good one to look at during this particular distress that we are going through and we'll examine that here in a few minutes but i would like to hear from you if you have any favorite bible passages um and and we don't have to limit it to bible passages uh, sometimes people prefer certain quotes they like to quote older people quote poets whoever if there's anything that you've heard that says okay this gives me comfort and we're going to keep on keeping on we know that we're you know, there's a song, and we're not going to play any songs that are written by someone else, fear of copyright and all that. But uh, I think there's a song about we're all in this together, something or another, something or another. Well, we are. We, we really are. And um, 
We just need to keep that in mind. And if there's any stories you want to share, maybe any worries or concerns, hopes and dreams even, I'm, I'm, open, I'm open to hear about those hopes and dreams as well. All right, so let me check a couple of things here, see how we're doing. And if you would, just kind of um, let me know that you are here watching. If you wouldn't mind, either in Facebook or YouTube, just say, hey, we're here. And um, if you're first time, if you're first time joining a conversation, let us know. Say, I'm first time part of this conversation, and I'm from Timbuktu, Alaska, or wherever. And uh, we'd, we'd love to know that as well. Because it helps us to greet one another, helps us to get to know one another when we, we see who is with us. All right, let me double check a couple of things here, making sure that everything is going nice and smooth. I'm hoping we don't have any interruptions uh, on the internet wise as we did the other night. All right, let's see. So Jared, you have a story. You have something you'd like to share with us, I gather. Here, let me show you why I am saying that. Jared drops into our fate. Well, there you go. All right. Jared drops into our Facebook chat room that he has a story and he'd like to share it. Uh, he would like to, I'm assuming, share it with us. With us. Um, so, Jared, if you would like to do that, if you want to call, I'll put you on the air. Uh, just be sure to call the number you see there on the screen, 405 726 0874 and I'll be more than happy to to um, answer and give you a couple of moments to share to share your message there or your story or whatever it is there that you'd like to share with that. All right, bear with me just a moment. There we go. And there we go. And this was Jared's comment right there. <laughs> All right, so I'll leave that up to you, Jared. And, and again, if you got a favorite Bible verse, go ahead and feel free to share it with us. All right, let me grab my handy dandy headphones that I dropped over there. All right, caller, you're on the line. I'm all right. listening and all that other stuff. We have Jared Dart from what city in Arizona, Jared? Goodyear. Goodyear. Okay. Yeah, it's about twenty about twenty minutes out west of Phoenix. Okay. All right. So what would you like to share with us this evening? So this is actually a lesson from I did, um, kinda of related from what you were talking about last night. You know, you see so many people, congregations, you fall in love with them very quick. You know. You fall in love with the brethren. So it is hard for you know, when you're separated. It, you know, miss your brethren, you you know, some people fall away. Some people stay in touch. I'm one of those persons that, you know, stay in touch with people. You know, make sure everyone's spiritually fed with, you know, God's Word. And, you know, our congregation, we have a step-by-step um, -step video that goes out every other Thursday. You know, eight-minute video. It helps a lot of people. And, you know, again, you know, congregations now are trying everything that they can to keep the members together. During this time, they are. They are. It's what's interesting is is the church fundamentally, while it is not a social institution, the local congregation is composed of family members, and so it is important that we be a family towards one another, part of this body, and when we take for granted the fact that well we'll see each other you know, every Sunday and Wednesday night, we kind of forget what would happen if we stopped, if for some reason we could not see each other. And this distress right. has kind of brought that into a reality. And so it is important that we try to stay in com communication with one another. You're exactly right about You know, that. it kind of reminds me of Stephen. He was 100% committed for teaching the Word of God. You know, that's how we need to be. We need to be 100% committed and, you know, saying judge with our brethren. That's right. Because Stephen lived, Stephen lived for it, and he died for it. That's exactly and that's right. The verse you, and that's the verse you can find in Acts 7, 54 through 60. 
Who was it that stoned or consented to the death of Stephen, Jared? I have it right here. Where is it? Mm -hmm. He would later become an apostle selected by the Lord. It is Saul. That's right. That's exactly right. And Saul, if you would, continued with the commitment that Stephen had once Saul was converted to the truth. And he right. kept kept right on going. So, All right, Jared, I, I appreciate that yeah. thought. Um, any, anything else real quick before we move on? No, just, you know, continue to pray. You know, hopefully this virus will end soon and you know, all congregations can go back to normal. That's what our prayers are seeking. That's exactly right. As All right, Jared, hey, I appreciate know. calling in. If you've got anything else that comes to mind later on here, feel free to feel free to let me know. Okay. Will do. All right, have a good one, bud. Okay. Right, Bye-bye. Stephen's a great example. And our distress is not because of Christianity. Um, but we are suffering, going through a tribulation because of the virus that is about. So yes, there is a, there is kind of a, a commonality there to some extent. Um, we have, let's see, uh, we've got several listening from different areas. Lori Morris um, is listening from Southern California. You know, I was supposed to hop an airplane this upcoming Saturday to go to California. And I was invited to hold a gospel meeting at the Bellflower Congregation where Sister Morris attends. And this is where Tom Thornhill, who we heard the other night, he preaches. And that's not happening now um, as a result. So I, I, will, I will miss that opportunity to be out there with them. Kelsey, we're going to share a comment, just a little bit self-serving, but I do appreciate it. Kelsey says, I really appreciate these get-togethers slash studies. It helps keep our minds on things that are above and not on things of this world. Well, thank you. That is a very good point, and hopefully, hopefully that is what we're doing. Uh, Roger Bratton. Oh, I know, I know you, uh, Roger. You've got a daughter and a son-in-law, I think, that we know very well. Hello, John from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Good to see you. Hope all is well. Remember, brighter days are ahead. God is in control. Roger and Nancy. That's right. That is exactly right. Better days are ahead. And we've got Michael Davis bringing up the rear, saying, finally, getting on board tonight. I emphasize finally. He didn't, but I forget it would fit. All right, let's go ahead and open our Bibles, if you would, to Psalms chapter 49 is where we're going to go. Psalms chapter 49. Let's see, real quick, before we do that, You know, before we do that, turn with me, if you would. And, you know, Chuck, I'm going to share this typo and all because it reminds me that other people make mistakes as well, and I make plenty of them. But I am going to help you out there just a little bit and correct it. There we go. So turn, let's turn over real quick to Isaiah 26, verse 20. I know it says, me here is actually Chuck has submitted this. There's a way that I can replace my name at the bottom, but I didn't do that at this moment. So over in Isaiah chapter 26, there in verse 20, here's what we read. So Isaiah writes, Come, my people, into your chambers, and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation is past. You know, some people have brought up that there are Old Testament uh, situations where quarantine was called for, whether it was individuals such as who had leprosy, uh, or the whole camp of Israel, until the time of their cleansing had taken place. And here there seems to be a, a reference to sin being present and the judgment of the Lord coming. See a little the title header there says take refuge from the coming judgment. 
But here he tells the people to go into the chambers and shut the doors and wait until the indignation is passed. It's a good passage. Interesting to what we are going through today. Go in our house, shut the doors, and wait a little bit. Um, yeah, Dale was scheduled to preach this upcoming Sunday. Now, maybe, maybe, Kelvin and I can get him down to the building and have him preach the sermon and we record it and play it on Sunday. We'll talk about that. That is a very definite possibility. And Rhonda, of course, is kind of a private or personal conversation. She says, we will miss hearing you. Maybe we will be able to hear him yet, Rhonda. We'll talk more about that um, in the next day or so. But definitely we can do that. Isaiah. No, Psalm, sorry. 49. And again, feel free to share any passages you would like as we go through. We'll bring it in. If you have any comments about what we're about to look at, please feel free to share those. We'd love to hear from you. You can tweet us at John Duval. It's that simple. A little bit narcissistic, but it's that simple. You can call me at 405-726-0874 or text me 405-726-0874. That is how Chuck sent in his comment just a moment ago. You can even send an email if you would like to questions at John Duval, you got it, dot net. Send them to questions at johnduval.net. And don't forget your selfie. Send a selfie in to selfie at johnduval.net. It'll come up here in just a second. There we go. Selfie at johnduval.net. And I'll put it in the pre-roll that we run before we begin our conversation. So, that being said, let's look at Psalm 59, 49. So the psalmist here, as you go through here, there's several things to note, just especially as, as we begin this. He says, Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. You know, we are all equal in the eyes of God as far as accountability goes. No one person can rise up and say, I am better than everybody else. God is the one that judges all of us, and so we all are on an equal footing. Now, the rich are no better, the poor are no worse. We all stand equal in the sight of God. And so the psalmist here, he's going to kind of make this point, and this was something the Israelites had to remember. And I'll tell you why this was in part so important. There would be times in their existence where they would go through times of poverty. In other times, they would go through times of abundance. But it would be easy to look around at the grass on the other side of the fence, to look around at the other nations and their great wealth, and think to themselves, why don't we have this type of wealth? Why aren't we like this? Um, and An interesting story, when you jump forward to... Let me think about this for a moment. Y'all need to help me out here. When we jump forward to, I think it's Hezekiah. Correct me if I'm wrong. I get Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah swapped around. I believe it's Hezekiah. So the Lord had greatly blessed Hezekiah and uh, had given victory over the Assyrian nation. Remember, they had come in and taken the northern nation of Israel captive. They had laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. Hezekiah had withheld them back. He dug the, 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 the uh, aquifer underneath the city and all that. And so finally, the Assyrians are ultimately de de defeated by, by the Babylons. And so an envoy is sent from Babylon to Jerusalem to see Hezekiah. And Hezekiah took him. At this time, there was great wealth there in the temple. Took him through all the temple, showed them that his house and all the wealth there, and then they went back home. And then he was challenged on that and said he shouldn't have done that. Because now, and this is a broad paraphrase, but now they know the wealth that is here, and they will one day carry it away. So there were times that Israel did very well, and other times not so much, and ultimately they would lose a, a, a good, a great amount of the wealth when the Babylonians came in to take them. So here he is he's reminding the Israelites here that both low and high, rich and poor together, 
All right, listen to what he says. My mouth shall speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall give understanding. Now, this is my mouth speak wisdom, meditation of my heart shall give understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will disclose my dark saying on the harp. Now, the psalmist is about to share something with us about the evil days that would come. And he's about to speak of this. And the, the idea of what is stated there in verses 3 and 4 is the idea that he's about to reveal the truth regarding the way that we should be. He's about to speak the wisdom and, and listen. He's, he has listened to the proverb that was spoken. And so he's going to disclose my dark saying on the harp. You've got a little footnote there. And the, the New King James Version does really good with uh, giving an abundance of footnotes to help us understand. And we have a riddle there for dark. Other translations, I think the ESV may say riddle there. But anyway, so what is this riddle? What is this dark saying? Well, we'll look at that here in just a moment. Before we do, again, let me invite you. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to share them. Feel free to let us hear them. You'll see the information there at the bottom of the screen. I'd like to have you participate in this conversation. Um, so let, let's continue. Notice what he says. He poses the question, Why should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me? He says, Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their souls is costly and it shall cease forever that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. All right, so ask the question, what is he saying here? What is he talking about? Well, look at verse 5 there. First off, why should I fear the days of evil when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me? Why should I fear that? Well, the answer is you should not fear it. Okay, You should not fear that evil. You should not fear that iniquity. You should not fear the people of evil. And here's why. The individuals who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, these individuals, he's talking about them now, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. So you, you have all this wealth. They looked around and they see the wealth of the wicked. And here's the thing. The wealth and all of their money cannot redeem a brother. They cannot give to God a ransom for him. So the idea here is, is so, you know, despite how much money they have, when it comes to God, it is meaningless. So here's a question for you. You can kind of help me out, and I'll let y'all look it up if y'all would. Jesus tells a parable of a man. And, uh, let's see, I'm going to leave out a few of the missing pieces. But he ends up saying, let me sit back and eat and drink and be merry. Why did he say that? Okay. Take a moment. For you. Look, look up, look up in, in your Bibles there to that particular parable that Jesus shared. Something about this man in his life uh, you know, put him into the position of saying, let me eat, drink, and be merry. Let me sit back because I have everything that I need. So what do you think about that? What is, where is that passage found? And who is, you know, what, what had that man done that put him into that position? And then, of course, you know the follow-up question that will come from that, and I'd love to hear from you on this. What was God's reply? If you didn't get a coffee before we started, I'm sorry, there are no commercial breaks. But, hey, if you're watching this on the phone, you can take me to the kitchen with you. <clears throat> oh, we've got several comments there. David, Michael, while you're looking up what I asked you to look up there, he shares with us, and this is to do with the psalms that we're singing, psalm that we're reading, both mouth and um, heart, this is what he meant, are united in the wisdom. Going back there in the verse that we were reading where he says, I will incline my ear to a proverb. 
Um, in verse 3, my mouth shall speak wisdom and the meditation of my heart shall give understanding. That's right. Both mouth and heart are united there in the understanding. That's a very, very good point. We've got one answer coming in so far. If you got a verse reference, let's throw that in there as well. Rhonda shares the passage that I was referencing in regards to Hezekiah. And I'll bring this up on the screen as we are discussing this. In 2 Kings chapter 20, there in verse 12, we won't read all of it, but this is the account that I was referencing when the envoy from Babylon came to Hezekiah. And they had heard that Hezekiah, of course, had been sick. There we go. And Hezekiah was attended of them, showed them all the house of his treasure, silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment, and all his armory, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Now, we come down into the text a little bit further. And notice here, what have they seen in your house was the question posed by Isaiah the prophet. And Hezekiah had said, they've seen everything. So Isaiah says to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Uh, so thank you, Rhonda, for sharing that passage with us. All right, so let's look at a couple of answers here that have come in into, to the question. The man says, I'm going to... You know, let my soul sit back and take it easy. And, you know, I I've, I've can enjoy life now. I've got everything that I need. Well, um, the, his, uh, well, boy, y'all got these out of order. Hang on a second. <laughs> Over in Luke chapter 12, verse 19, Phyllis shared the uh, answer, at least the location. And so let's turn over there real quick and I'll bring that up on the screen. In this particular parable here, let's go back a little bit earlier. You have a rich man. He thought within himself, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So I said, I will do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater and there I will store all my crops and all my goods. Um, and this, and Mary Cross shared this, this was the question that he kind of asked. You know, what else can he possibly do? He has, he has laid up for himself in, in, in very much great abundance. But what was God's reply to that? Well, Michael Davis shares with us the reply. Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be? So here's an individual who put a lot of stock in his wealth and not enough stock in preparing what he should have prepared. And really, the, the point, the, the the point isn't so much that what he did was 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 wrong. It was the confidence that he put within it, and the fact that you've done all this work. Now your life is going to be gone, and whose will this stuff be? Um, you can't take it with you. I heard a story years ago. You know how preachers do with stories and everything. They'll hear a story and. They'll elaborate on it, and I don't know where the actual real story began and what the <laughs> uh, elements of reality are present. But anyway, so you have this woman whose husband passed away. and Boy, he was a wealthy man. He was wealthy. But he, um, he stipulated something that really surprised his wife and his lawyers and his estate managers and everything. He put in his will that all of his wealth had to be buried with him. He wanted all of his wealth buried with him. And so they thought about it for a while, looked for any legal loopholes, couldn't find any. So they did what the man asked. The wife made out a check for the full sum of his uh, wealth and threw it in the coffin when they buried him. Point is, he couldn't take it with him. And who does it belong to? It's going to be spent by his wife. Now, I doubt very seriously that's a true story, but it's one that kind of makes the point that we cannot take it with us. And this was the problem here. This night, the soul would be required of the man. So when we put our reliance upon wealth, we are putting, we're building our house upon the sand to borrow from another parable that Jesus um, had used in Matthew chapter 7. 
All right, and uh, Jared Dart said, John, I followed you on Instagram. Just kind of a random comment there. And I do have an Instagram account, starting to use it a little bit more, and it is John M. Duval. if you're interested in looking that up, John M. Duval. And then Rhonda says, Luke 12, 16, that Sid in following his ground had yielded up plenty, but he was not prepared for it to go to someone else. He thought he would have plenty of time to spend it. All right, so let's go back then to our text of Psalms, chapter 49. And this time in Psalms 49, let's look there right around verse 6. Again, if you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to participate. If you're watching this through Facebook, you can use the comment area. If you're watching through YouTube, use the chat area. You can also call me or text me at 405-726-0874. 405-726-0874. So they cannot ransom their brother. They cannot redeem, for the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever. So think about that. Their, their loved one dies. Their, their loved one perishes. They, they perish, and there's nothing they can do to help them with their great wealth. For the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever. But the psalmist then goes on to say that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit, kind of fin finishing up the thought there. So your loved one dies, and there's nothing you do about it. You can't pay the money to restore their soul. And interestingly enough, think about the, uh, the story that Jesus told of the rich man and Lazarus. You know, the rich man, he died. He, he was, he's kind of like the brother here. He dies and he goes and he's in torment. You know, he's gone now to the pit to live eternally. And he says, hey, can you send Abraham back to warn my brothers? And Abraham, in the, in the account there, Abraham says, they've got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And so I thought, you know, kind of an interesting you know, statement here comparing with the, uh, what Jesus told about Lazarus and the rich man. So let's go a little farther here with the text. And in just a moment, we'll look back to our chat room. We've got some, some comments popping in, and that's really good. So verse 10, For he sees wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the senseless person perish and leave their wealth to others. And ultimately, that's what the point that he's making you look at the wealth, they look at the wealth, the wealthy, and you think they've got it very good. You think they have everything they need, and they'll have a wonderful forever life, and they won't. The wealth goes to others. There is someone, and I won't mention his name, that I know, and you might know, who has a pretty interesting license um, vanity, not a vanity tag, but it's a tag on the front of his car. And it says, spending my kids' inheritance. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. I did know a man years ago who had a good bit of wealth. And, but because of the choices his two children made, he chose not to leave them much of it at all. Maybe just, just a small little portion. But that, that's the point, though. We leave it behind. And it's a fool who thinks that he has it forever to spend. And let's see. Let's finish up real quick about their inner thought. Their inner, let me bring it over on the screen for you there. Their inner thought, he says, is that their houses will last forever. Their dwelling places to all generations, they call their lands after their own names. You know, you, you stop and think about a king. David was the composer of many of these psalms. Sounds like he's writing about kings, doesn't he? Sounds like he's writing about kings. They establish their throne. <clears throat> they establish their homes. And they think it's going to be with them forever. All right. So let's see. What are the comments we have now in the chat room? Michael Davis makes a point. I think it's a good one to share. He says, the point the Lord makes is that we must be rich toward God. We will never exhaust God's riches and he wants to give them to us bountifully. You know, Mike, I think that's, that's, that's not that's a very meaningful statement, especially during the day and age we live in. Um, they're kind of warning people about how you spend your money. They want you to continue spending since the kind of the stimulus package to help people endure through this time period. Many people 
have lost their jobs or at least have a reduction in their income. And so you have to be very careful to begin to realize that the money does, is not an, an, a, a bottomless pit, if you would, which just or always fills up, never ending, a never ending supply. There you go. But when we think about the riches of God, we'll never exhaust the riches of God. And he wants to give them to us bountifully. And they are spiritual riches. And we understand that and are so thankful for that. Jared Dart says, for those who don't know me, I have uh, grandparents who attend at Seminole Point. He generally comes to town about once a summer. I don't know if he'll be here this summer. We'll have to see how everything goes. But we, do, we generally, and have seen Jared once a summer for several years here. And we're very fond of his grandparents, very much so. Let's continue with the uh, with more comments. Uh, well, now we got a con <laughs> we have a conversation going on, so we'll just skip that because I don't know that person. Second Kings chapter twenty is a passage that Debbie here has shared, and that's going to be right in the area that we were looking at a while ago in regards to the story of Hezekiah. So let me bring that up, and I think she was helping me out there with that. There we go. And that reminds me, Debbie, I'm glad you sent this through Facebook. It reminds me that I need to double check the uh, text messages that come in. Return until Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I've heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. And he continues. This is where Hezekiah is granted 15 more years to live <clears throat> by the Lord. Then after being given that by the Lord is when he makes the mistake and takes a little bit too much pride in what the Lord has given him. I think that might be a way of looking at that. A little bit too much pride in what the Lord had given to him. All right, let me see. Checking my chats over here and chats over here. So let's come back. Um, Mary reminds us of a statement made by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount where he tells us to lay not up for ourselves treasures on earth where, raw, where rust and moth can destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But we are to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven where nothing destroys them. No rust, no moth, no thieves, nothing like that. That's a good point. <laughs> okay, so the one who owns the tag I was telling you about admitted it, so I'll share it. And Dale says, my daughter bought that for me and insisted that we install it on the car. <laughs> That's I, I, I fully believe that, Dale. That some, sounds like something that she would do. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, good conversation in the chat room. Some of it's somewhat personal. Um, Rhonda disagree with Debbie on that last one, how it definitely does apply with what's going on now. So that's a good, good point. All right, so let's see. Let me check on our time. All right, 749. We will come back to our Bible program. So let's come back again to Psalms chapter 49 and let's jump down in the text here to right around verse 11. Psalms 49 verse 11, I think is where we're picking up at. Now, I think what was interesting about this is that he, he depicts what's within their mind. and They just have so much confidence in the things that they have. But he says in verse 12, Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain he is like the beast that perish. And that's a very good point. You know, man himself, though he may be in honor, you know, think about every king that has ever lived has died. Even Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, but he arose, God raised him from the dead, never to die again. But every royalty, every king, every queen, everyone in power, everyone of honor. You think about the judges on the Supreme Court, anyone to whom you would even attach the phrase, the honorable so-and-so has died or will die at some point. And that's his point. And then he says, he's like the beasts that perish. So fundamentally, there is no difference 
You know, that honorable man that has been held in high esteem by the world and thinks that he rules the whole world, he's going to die like that dog. He'll die like that cow. He'll die like the animal and be buried just as the animal also perishes. And then verse 13, this is a way of those who are foolish and of their posterity who approve their sayings. Okay, so this is the point that David's kind of building up to. As we said, we'll go at the beginning. There's an equality there among the rich and the poor, the, the smart and, and the not so smart. <laughs> you know, there, there, there is an equality there. We are equal in the sight of God. And there's only one thing that gives us an advantage over the others, and it's not ourselves. It is God. It is their foolishness and our willingness to listen to God. This is a way of those who are foolish and of their posterity who approve of their sayings. All right, so it's not just the wealthy themselves, but it's, it's their offspring. It's those who would follow after them, who agree with them. This is sheer foolishness. They all will go the way of the wind. Jensen shares with us a passage. And again, if you'd like to do the same thing, we've got a few minutes remaining. You can drop them into the Facebook comment area or the YouTube chat area. Um, through Twitter, if you would like, it's uh, my handle is at is John Duval, or send us a text message at 405-726-0874. So let's read what Jensen has shared with us here. And this comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 2. He drops it in here for us. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires. Yet God does not give him power to eat of it, but a foreigner consumes it. This is vanity and is an evil affliction. You know, that happened to Israel on a number of occasions, especially during the time of the judges. They would set about to grow their crops and to plant their vineyards and things like that. And then because of their disobedience unto God, God would allow an enemy to swoop in and take everything that they had worked so hard for. But it was, was because of their disobedience that he allowed that to happen. And so the, 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 the rich man here that the, the Solomon is writing about, the ecclesiastical preacher here, he's writing about, truly this is the case. His wealth and honor will go to someone else. And so he says, this is vanity and is an evil affliction. We have also another comment. This one comes in from Chuck as a text uh, message. And I'm going to see if I can get this shared properly now. Let's see. While I wait on that to transfer over, I want to bring in Michael's comment here real quick. He said, have you noticed? There we go. He says, have you noticed that when David or Solomon uses the word fool, it's so awesome, it's, it's so awesome means, it also means godless one. I think that's what you're saying there, Mike. Often, he corrects that in the next, next message, so I won't bring that up there. He corrects it. So often, so it so often means godless one. The word fool does. You know, we think about fool, um, and you kind of think about it in the New Testament sense when Jesus is telling the Jews, you don't call anyone a fool unless you, you, you're there before being in danger, I believe, of, the, of, of hellfire. Well, here, the way Solomon is using it is talking about someone who is godless, who is godless. All right. So Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 7 through 9 is what Brother Chuck has sent in to us. So let's turn over there real quick to Ecclesiastes, and we're going to go to chapter 9, specifically verses 7 through 9. And notice here as we read the following. The ecclesiastical writer says, Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your works. Let your garments also be white, and let your head lack no oil. Live faithfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life, which he has given you under the sun. All your days are vanity, for that is your portion in life, and in the labor which you perform under the sun. 
Solomon kind of had a depressing way of looking on life, didn't he? But ultimately what Solomon learned is that when everything is said and done, it's all vanity. No matter how great of a building you build, it will one day be destroyed. No matter how much wealth you amass, it will one day go to someone else. And, and when you come to the end of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, he talks about when the, um, the bowl is broken and the silver cord is loosed and, and so forth. He's talking about death there. And so then he draws the conclusion in the, the latter part of Ecclesiastes 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Let us fear God and keep his commandments. This is man's whole duty. And that was the ultimate lesson there that Solomon learned through all those years of experimenting, if you would. Jared shares with us following thought at 17 years old, not as experienced. But if I find the opportunity to preach or help others to know Christ, I do the best I can to help them spiritually and spiritually feed them the word of God. You're off to a great start with that desire, Jared. And I commend you for that. And I would encourage you to continue on towards that. Dan reminds us of Amos chapter 6, verses 3 through 7. Amos chapter 6, verses 3 through 7. We read, Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who cause the seat of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock, and calves from the midst of the stall, <clears throat> who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore they shall now go captive as the first of the captives, and those who recline at banquets shall be removed. Now this is a strong message to a people who were um, very abusive of their wealth, who took great stock in their wealth and no stock in service unto God. And I found that interesting, that phrase, and they drank wine from a bowl. The only time I've ever drank from a bowl is when I've ate all the cereal and we've got milk left in the bowl. Then you drink the bowl. I guess you can drink soup out of a bowl. Uh, my grandmother, when I was a kid growing up, she would make gravy and biscuits and so we'd sit around for breakfast and she'd take the big old biscuits she would make. And uh, there was always a special biscuit for me. I did a lot of grandkids, but I, I guess I threw a fit over her biscuits when I was little. And what it was, it was a leftover dough <laughs> that she had to you know, make either a big one or some odd shape to get it all fit and not waste. But anyway, I would watch her. She would put um, a biscuit in a bowl and she would pour gravy over that biscuit. And then she'd eat the biscuit and drink, not gravy, she'd pour coffee over the biscuit. Try that one, Dan. Pour coffee over the biscuit. And then she'd drink the coffee out of the bowl. You know, drinking wine out of a bowl, she'd drink coffee out of a bowl. Okay, so let's see. Let's come back then to our text. I'm going to check two other places here real quick. <clears throat> now let's finish up Psalms 49 real quick before... We are out of time. Psalms 49, and let's come down to right around verse 14 there. Again, he's talking about the, the wealthy and what happens to them. And he says, Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall be consumed in the grave, far from dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. You know, oftentimes there's been discussion over whether or not the Jews believed in, in an afterlife. And I believe they did. When David himself had heard that his child had died, uh, he quit his mourning. And that really surprised his servants that when they carried the news to him, that David quit mourning, got up, and cleaned himself up, and they were shocked. And, and David said, while the child was still alive, there was hope that maybe God would give him life. But now that the child is dead, there's nothing more that can be done, and David knows that one day he will go to be with him. And so in verse 15, there's that idea. Whereas the fool trusts their money, David, the, the people of God, trusts in him 
to redeem their soul from the power of the grave. And that, of course, brings back 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there in the latter part of it, where he asks, O grave, where is thy sting? O, uh, or, o death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? You know, fundamentally, the victory that we can now have is in Jesus Christ, and there is no longer the sting of death, because God shall receive us. And then verse 16, let's read real quick. Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lives, he blesses himself. For men will praise you when you do well for yourself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. A man who is in honor yet does not understand is like the beasts that perish. And that goes back to the earlier statement where he made that same comparison there. But the, really the key phrase there is what we just read in verse 15. He says, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave for he shall receive me. So we trust in the Lord with all our heart and we lean not on our own understanding. Let's see, we've got a couple more comments. And this comment is very important, so I want you to listen to it. It's very, very important. Michael says, in all of his infinite wisdom, or finite wisdom, you might want to give a shout out at Truth Factor tomorrow. Computerized preacher. But I love you for it. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I don't do very well. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yes, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock, um, a handful of preachers and I, we study through different books of the Bible. We're currently studying through the book of Romans. And the reason why Mike plugged it is because he's going to be leading the discussion tomorrow with Romans chapter 10. And so if you, if hey, since you're not going to work now or because of what we're going through, um, go to truthfactor.com and click on live video tomorrow at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time. Um, we do have both a YouTube page and a Facebook page. You can find it at both of those, but it's Truth Factor Live. Search for Truth Factor Live, all one word. All right, let's see. Now let's see if we can find a pertinent comment to this. We'll do that. It's a good point. A good reminder has come across. Um, Jared said, I'd love to do that preacher training camp that you guys have. That may be something that we discuss in the future. Jared, maybe something we discuss. Rhonda says, maybe their cups were too small and they wanted so much wine they used bowls since they would hold more. Yeah, I think archaeologists have proven the only cups they had back then were those tiny tea cups that you have to hold right, right like that. So the alternative, if you wanted to really get wasted, would be the big old bowl. I don't know. That's, I like that. That's a funny point. Funny point. And Jared reminds us to remain committed. All right, so we, are reached, we have reached the end of our time and the end of our psalm. Um, I do want to remind everyone that tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, uh, we will have a live stream, but it will be for the Seminole Point um, Church of Christ. You know What we're doing on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday is my own little private thing that we do here together in our conversation. But on Wednesday night at 7, we'll have an interactive Bible study and you can view that uh, if you want to go to seminalpoint.church and click on uh, broadcast, then click on main or main auditorium, and that's where you'll see the study. But you can also find it on our YouTube page. We have a YouTube page. It is youtube.com slash seminalpoint, P-O-I-N-T-E, and a Facebook page, seminalpoint, P-O-I-N-T-E. That's tomorrow at 7 PM, we will be continuing in our study through Colossians, and I will have another video for our rock class. So there'll be another video, a new one tomorrow night to kind of help take a few moments to teach our young people. All right. Well, I think that's it. Um, Mary tells us that we did not mention a very important statement made by Christ. Regarding the rich man, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven, is what Jesus said. And that's a good point. And there's a lot more we could talk about being rich. You can be wealthy and serve God and have the right heart and disposition. First Timothy 6 talks about that. But most of the time or on many occasions, wealth 
pulls people away from God. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining me for this time of conversation. I think for myself, it has been very encouraging, and I hope that it has been encouraging for you also. The point is to give us an opportunity to talk, to give us an opportunity to communicate, to spend a little bit of time together during this time of social separation. I think it's very important to have one another together to be with one another. All right, let's see. I've got one more thing I need to do, and I've got a minor issue here. And let's see. My mouse has chosen to die on me or not die on me. There we go. All righty. Well, thank you for your time. Let's go and have a quick word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, you've given us so much in the blessings that are found in Jesus Christ. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for those. It's our prayer, dear Lord, that you'll watch over those who are trying to find a way to treat and to possibly vaccinate against this virus. We pray that you'll be with their hands and we pray that if you will, if it's your will, that they will be able to find what they need to help us be able to overcome the distress that we're currently facing and can resume in our public gatherings to worship you. Heavenly Father, for those who have chosen or have not yet chosen to follow you, we pray that at some point they will make that decision to do so. We ask that you'll be with us and pray that, as always, you will continue to watch over and protect our souls. These things, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. And if everything goes according to my plans, and they don't always do, but if everything goes according to my plan, we will, plan, we will be back here again Thursday night at 7 o'clock p.m., Together, though apart. Have a wonderful evening.